Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Widera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who's our guest today? Today we have Paula Spann, who is a writer at the New York Times for the New Old Age, and she is also teaches journalism at Columbia. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. It's my high honor to be here. It's so great to have you here. And Paula, we start off with uh, the guest uh, asking for Alex to sing a particular song. You had a song for Alex? I did. It's my old favorite because I was always so happy to hear a song that was not about a blue-eyed blonde that I asked him to <laughs> sing Van Morrison's Brown-Eyed Girl. Uh, hey, where did we go? The days when the rains came Down in the hollow Playing a new game Laughing and a running, hey, hey Skipping and a jumping in a misty morning, far with our oh, hearts are thumping, and you, my brown eyed girl, you, my brown eyed girl, do you remember when oh, we used to sing? Sha la 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 tita. He's leaving out the verse about how the brown-eyed girl got to make love in the green grass <laughs> behind the stadium. <laughs> That'll be at the end of the podcast. Yes. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So, Paul, um, uh, you just gave a talk to us at UCSF on, I love this title, Working with the Enemies of the People. Uh, I think it's actually even making friends with the enemies <laughs> of the people. Making friends with the enemies of the people. Um, right. I, I was fascinated by the talk, and you gave um, uh, a lot of us some very helpful hints about how we can work with journalism and journalists. So you gave a lot of helpful hints of how we can work with journalists um, and the importance of it for our field. I remember you specifically saying, because there will never be enough geriatricians or palliative care doctors to meet the needs. I mean, ideally, you would be having these conversations one-on-one -on -one with your patients face-to-face -face and their families, but there will never be enough of you. And you know all this stuff that an aging population, a country with an aging population needs to know. So we're sort of the translators and the middle people that can help get your research out, your message out, uh, because our readers want to know this stuff too. I was wondering if we can actually talk with our listeners on this Jerry Bell podcast about maybe a couple things that we can do as educators, as researchers, as clinicians in working with the media. What do you find helpful when, when you're talking to us? Well, probably the biggest single thing is just to be available to respond. Mm -hmm. As re Reporters are, they're usually not experts in healthcare. They need to talk to people who are, and they are always in a hurry, or they're frequently in a hurry. And so... Um, you'll send out a, a bunch of emails, and if, if you will respond to me, even if you can't talk to me right away, and let me know that we'll set up a time to talk, then at least I can relax a little bit and think, oh, phew. you know, there's somebody who will help me with this. And when people don't respond, I, I don't have time to pursue you. I just move on to the next person, and then that opportunity often goes away. Is it helpful so, for us to suggest other names if we're not? Yeah, Then and so... You have other responsibilities, clearly, besides talking to reporters. So if you if you are busy, you're traveling, you're on vacation, or, or I've happened to have asked you about something that you're not all that knowledgeable about, to send me on to somebody who is, um, to give me that person's email, or to give me that person's cell phone, or even make the introduction via email, mm -hmm. is hugely helpful. Um, it's really helpful to send people the text of relevant studies if you have them handy, mm -hmm. because oftentimes reporters are not subscribers, and all we can see is the abstract. So if you want us to know what's in the study, you know, we should know that. Mm -hmm. to, to have someone send it to you is really helpful, too. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that uh, you emphasize is speaking in clear <laughs> language, not using medical jargon. We're so ingra It's so ingrained in us. To speak in this language, yeah. it's so hard to break out for it. Is there a way that you can emphasize that point to our listeners? Uh, well, I mean, partly that's my job is to be the translator. Mm -hmm. But I, I did say my, my personal trigger word is comorbidities. And I will stop an interview like right in the middle or even in the middle of a sentence and say, wait, 
No one is going to understand what that means. Like, why would you not think about it? I mean, you, you talk like this all the time. You have your own language, but I will just say, could you rephrase that? Could we just say people with multiple multiple health problems? So you're um, saying multimorbidity is not a better word. Not better. <laughs> <laughs> Morbidity, it's not a word in common parlance. Like sickness is disease, any right. of those things. What was the word for pamphlet? Uh, it was called a deprescribing patient empowerment intervention. <laughs> <laughs> but they meant pamphlet. They meant pamphlet. <laughs> or possibly they meant brochure. But what they meant was some printed thing. And um, it, was, yeah, it was one of my personal favorites. Or even things like food insecurity, mm-hmm. uh, in, uh, as opposed to hunger, which I grant you are not precisely the same thing, but it's close enough. Mm-hmm. Um, because if, if readers get confused by the language you're using, it's not just that they're confused. They'll just stop. They'll right. just stop reading or listening. Right. I, I, this is not for me. And they'll click off and all the work you did to educate the reporter and all the work that the reporter did to try to be, it just goes away. Right. Can we talk about, you know, so in academics, a lot of us are used to publishing papers and we get the proofs and we read through them and we make corrections and then we send it back to the editors. But there's a pro- different sort of process with an article um, in New York Times or for any sort of reporter. Uh, uh, you, you don't, for example... Um, share the exact content of what you intend to publish. I mean, I do what you do with an editor. You know, we'll send it back and forth and work on the wording and stuff. But what I can't do, and people in medicine ask me to do it because it seems like a normal thing to them, is, Mm -hmm. you know, I'd be happy to see the article before it's published. And what they mean is I'll I'll try to help you make it accurate. They're not trying to control me or censor me, but I, I can't do it ethically, when I think something's ready for publication, it goes from me to my editor and not to anybody else. Because if I make this exception for a geriatrician or a palliative care specialist, I have to do it for anybody that asks, any politician, anybody who's going to call a lawyer, uh, anybody who's going to you know, tweet nasty things about me. Um, but we just don't invite negotiation. I will review things with you for accuracy. I won't let you rewrite yourself, and I, I won't let you control what I write. It's part of the independence of the press that you, you sort of have to guard this. Mm-hmm. And you're looking for both accuracy accuracy as a journalist, but also our judgment on right. what, why is this important. Is that right? Yeah. Wh- why is this important? Or do you think I'm actually – I've had people say, I don't think you should be following the line that you're following. You, you're, not, you're not understanding – what the issue is, or you're going off on a tangent, or you're giving undue attention to something that's really trivial and off topic. Um, Because not only do I want to get the numbers right and get your quotes right, but I want to understand the issue. And I'm not an expert, and you are. So if you think I'm barking up the wrong tree, I will appreciate your telling me why. And maybe I'll make a change, or maybe my editor will, or maybe we'll proceed anyway, but I'll be better informed I, I do. I want your perspective and not just the facts, ma'am. Now, how can people get in touch with you if they have important articles that they want to share that they think might be newsworthy? Or, or journalists in general. Yeah, journalists in general. I mean, our, our emails are usually, or, or, or Twitter handles uh, or Facebook links are usually on the article or not hard to find out. Anybody can Google me and find like three different working emails for me. I have a website because mm-hmm. um, I have a book that I promoted. So. Journalists are not hard to get to, mm-hmm. and there's no reason not to get in touch with them. The worst they're going to say is, I don't think so, but thanks. Right. So or same. stay in touch. Maybe you know there'll be another idea. We're always looking for ideas. Mm-hmm. And, and are journalists on social media like Twitter? Yeah. Like, I think probably virtually the entire staff of the New York Times is on Twitter. And uh, Facebook, a little less. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't do Instagram personally because I'm not a visual yeah. person, but um, yeah. But Why? you've had leads for articles from Twitter. Oh yeah, I've had leads from articles from Jerry from the Jerry Powell blog. Yeah, hey, I've heard of that before. Uh, yeah, I've heard that one. from uh, other people from your shop tweeting. I also I use Facebook as a way to try to find subjects, you know, human subjects that put a human face on an issue. So I'll mm-hmm. post it, um, anybody know somebody who's being treated with this drug, or you know, have you had this illness and what was your experience? I'm trying to find people to talk to me. Yeah, we're all over it. Why, why are journalists on Twitter? It seems like there, there are most of them are. Is there, is there a reason behind that? Because it's what we do. It's, you know, you yeah. traffic in information. That, journalists are terrible gossips. Like any newsroom is just like full of gossip because that's what you do. You don't turn it off when it's not about 
the president. It's yeah. like <laughs> you just share what you know, and people have opinions, and people want other people to see their stories. So I always post my column, and other people post their work, and we read each other. It's just yeah. part of the sea that you swim in. And it's you said something about journalists. You're always on a deadline. It's always it's short pieces of information, and that con- Twitter is conducive to that. You just get the little headline, right? The concise. You know, punchline there. You don't have to wade through something. I was actually a, a little disappointed when they started allowing photographs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, I just want the facts. Um, but now I'm, of course, used to it, uh, and I and I like them. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, it becomes an issue somewhat because we're supposed to be skeptical, but also nonpartisan, devoted to truth, but not promoting a particular candidate or point of view. Uh, and you have to be careful about your Twitter presence or your social media presence not to look like you're in some camp or other. And how do you decide what's what's newsworthy? You must get pitched all the time. Yeah. Like, what are the what are the key elements? You know, it's I, I I said it's like pornography. It's very hard to define, but you know it when you see mm-hmm. it. It's um, it's a sense that there's it may not be a whole new subject, but there is some new thing to say about it some study that confirms what people have always thought or some study that shows that it's not what people thought or um, a growing number of people with X problem or um, some new program that addresses a longstanding program. There will always be some uh, service articles that are just about how do you choose a nursing home? When do you need a geriatrician? What's a geriatric care manager? There'll always be some of those because there's a new cohort every few years that needs that information. Um, but aside from that, you sort of, your editor will have this attitude, whether they say it or not. That's like, why are you telling me this now? And you sort of have to have a reason of why now. The other thing you, you talked about when you're with us for Grand Rounds is media now comes in all shapes and sizes. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about that, what you meant? Yeah, it used to be so much easier, and I know that people are returning my calls and responding to my emails, and thank you if that was you. Um <laughs> Not because of my winning personality, but because of those three words, New and York and Times. But now the media universe is vastly broader, and people are doing good health and science reporting in a number of places that did not exist 10 years ago, places with names like BuzzFeed or Vox or The Daily Beast. Um, Stat News is only two years old, ProPublica, and some of these are nonprofits, so that's a new model. So... Just because someone someone is calling you and they're not from the L.A. Times uh, or the Boston Globe doesn't mean that they don't have an audience, that they don't have an expertise, and that it's not a good place for you to um, to give an interview or to share your research. Uh, one of your colleagues told me today that she got a call from a reporter for Nautilus, and she didn't know what it is. But I know what it is. It's a well-regarded science magazine, and she was right to have the interview with Nautilus, even though there was no Nautilus 10 years ago. Mm. Now there is. I wanted to ask you about New Old Age, if we could, which is a terrific column. It's the best, I think, aging uh, and caregiving column in the U.S. and has consistently been so. I know it's evolved over time from being a blog to a twice-monthly column. Right. And I wanted to ask you how you, um, or so what what, uh, stories in the New Old Age you are most proud of? Hmm. Well, I don't know if, this might not have been the one that got the most circulation, but we did a couple of columns about the sort of ageist prejudice that exists within long-term care facilities. Mm-hmm. And there was a very upscale continuing care retirement community in Norfolk, Virginia, in what had, as usual, was a sort of tiered service. So there was an independent living, an assisted living, and a nursing home section. And they had a beautiful waterfront view dining room And at one point, they decided that only independent living people could use it, and the assisted living and the nursing home residents had to use their own dining rooms, Mm -hmm. which caused this huge uproar uh, about how unfair it was. People had paid boatloads of money to Mm. be in this facility, and the children got, uh, got a lawyer. They were very angry. They got in touch with me and also with the local paper in Norfolk, um, did several stories on this. Uh, eventually, the management backed down. But meanwhile, the Department of Justice decided that this was a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Mm. 
Hmm. And they levied um, you know, not a big fine, but a fine mm-hmm. on the ownership. And they also went after another place that I wrote about. So, mm. uh, I, you know, we felt like, okay, we, we did good there. Yeah. That was good. Right. You help people. What, what, what is coming out? Or do you have any, um, you want to give our readers some sense of uh, ideas that are percolating um, that they might expect to see in the next few months? Um, I think not too much because then someone will scoop me. <laughs> uh, so I think I'll just keep that to myself, if you don't mind. Um, b- because I had these long... Sorry, uh, Alex. <laughs> I had this long lead time. I can only publish twice a month. Right. So someone right. else can come and you know write about it in the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal next week, and then I'm look like I'm a follower instead of a leader. So right, right. I think I won't. Yeah, the news cycle's fast. And how do you how do you come up with all these stories? You know, I I thought initially I can do this for maybe three years and then I'm gonna run out of material. Mm. Not true. The, I, I read all the I read many of the journals. I read Jags, I read New England Journal, I read JAMA and JAMA Internal Medicine. And various public relations people at various places are always pitching me ideas, many of which are unsuitable, but some of which work. And then research themselves, get to know me and tell me what they're working on. And also, nobody with an elderly parent is safe within 50 yards of me. Any story you tell me, I'm likely to say, hey, can I, can I talk to your mother about that? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, I don't know, it comes from a variety of places, but it is not running out. Yeah. So and since I've been here, the list has gotten mar- much longer. <laughs> so if, if we pitch a story, is that bothersome for a reporter or are they looking for that? Or is it a mixture? Depends. Um, right. You know, depends how you pitch. Don't don't pitch me about the the appointment of your new um, you know staff person because I don't care about that. Don't tell me that this is a good story because next week is National Alzheimer's Week because I don't care about formal weeks, months, or years. Um, and don't pitch me stuff about pediatrics, please. Like know, know what I do. Right. But aside from that, I think. I'm happy to hear from people who have ideas because I need. There's a constant need for material, mm-hmm. and if it's something smart and interesting, um, if I if I've done something on it, I can't do it again for a while. But I I'm not mad to hear from people who have good ideas about geriatrics and palliative care. I can't always oblige. I only have 25 columns a year now. It was easier when we posted twice a week or three times a week on mm-hmm. the blog. But no, I'm I'm happy to hear from people. I don't mm-hmm. think. You, you hear a certain amount of grousing about getting pitches from flax, flax being the unflattering word for public relations people, but it's usually because they're so off base. You know, don't send me stuff about fashion. What do you have you ever looked at anything I've done? But if it's something about what I actually do, I'm I'm pleased to have the connection. Right. Um, where do you see uh, journalism evolving in the you know the news? Where? What's I mean? New York Times has gone through this evolution you yeah. were describing yesterday, where they had like what is sixty blogs? We blogs had, like, about 60, polo. We had sixty blogs at one point because it seemed like blogs were going to be the savior of mm-hmm. print media, and then that turned out not to be true. Now we're doing a lot of virtual reality, a lot of video, a lot of specialized uh, s- digital sections. You know, if I knew that, I I could be a rich person. Right. Um, <laughs> But all that we know is that people are trying everything all over. It's a know, lot like of innovation. Just a lot of innovation. Some of them are going to fly and some of them are going to die. Um, who would have thought that Jeff Bezos would help resuscitate the Washington Post and right. yet it's going great guns um, and yet other places that are 100 years old just look anemic. And I, 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 I teach grad students and entrepreneurial was not a word we ever used to use. For journalists, that was someone else's problem. You write the stories, someone else will figure out how to market them, how to publish them, how to distribute them. Now, um, that could be part of your role, too. So it's it's really uncertain and kind of scary and kind of exciting. And I don't know if it's that supposed sh- curse, which probably is not even really a curse, that may you live in interesting times. I think these are interesting times if you're a reporter. Is it a... Um, is it a... Depressing time, exciting time to be a reporter? Like, what's the... Um, Both, because people are getting laid off in droves, and there are many, actually, many fewer, say, newspaper reporters than there were 20 years ago. Just, you know, and if you're an older person like me, I'm 
try not to be coy about my age, so I'll be 68 this summer. And to be 68 and to be a working journalist, I am so lucky. I just feel lucky every day. Um, but then on the other hand, my students are going out and they're doing really extraordinary stuff, and I'm so proud of them. Um, they're negotiating all this. It's normal to them. Mm. They don't remember some bygone day when you signed on to be a reporter at a paper and you were there for 30 years. Who does that? Mm -hmm. So they're just everywhere trying everything, and that's, that's kind of cool to see. We have a fair amount of people who listen to this who are also m medical educators, and they do research, but it's not like the typical research in journals. Um, but they're doing really innovative stuff as far as you know, trying to change how people, how med students talk about um, end-of-life issues or palliative care issues or developing new geriatric curriculum. Is, is, that so, is there an intersection between that and journalists or... It is, there could be if it, if it, it could be if what you eventually come up with is something that consumers will need to know and use. Yeah. If you're mostly working within the profession, it's a little too inside baseball, and I'm going to have trouble getting ordinary people who are not medical students or medical educators to pay attention. Yeah. But if it's going to end up like helping people with their advanced care planning or it's going to end up with some kind of checklist that people can use, something that the public can use as well as medical people can use, then maybe. It's, you know, this is, these things about what's a story, what's not a story are highly subjective mm -hmm. and you know, what interests one person might not interest another. It's not like there's some kind of, um, you know, algorithm I can suggest that, yes, that is something the New York Times will like. No, that is not. It, it's you know how it hits a certain person on a certain day. Well, I, I feel like most of the stuff that I read and that really impacts me is not about a population, but it, you write about a single person. I try to do that whenever I can. It's the bait. You know, how do you get some somebody to read a story about a disease they don't have, a condition they've never thought of, a, a, a trend that they may or may not be part of? How do you lure them in? And one time-honored way that reporters do this is to put a human face on an issue or a trend. So if I'm writing about the enormous increase in the number of older adults who are living together without being married in, uh, in couples, um, the data is really interesting, but I have to find that couple. And I used Facebook, actually, to find this couple in Philadelphia that... They take care of each other's health. They are each other's health care proxy. They share the cost of their two homes. They go to concerts and theater, and they're not married. And I needed those people. So, Alex, how about um, you end us with a song? You want to join me on the chorus? Uh, I'll, yeah. do, I'll do a little bit of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the verse that Paula requested. <laughs> so hard to find my way. Now that I'm all on my own I saw you just the other day And my, how you have grown Cast me memory back there, Lord Sometimes I'm overcome just thinking about Making love in the green grass Behind the stadium with you My brown-eyed girl You, my brown-eyed girl Remember when we used to sing? Sha la 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 la. Yeah, sing it again. Sha la 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 la. Sha la 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 da 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 da. Sha la 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 la